I told you earlier about the theme of our conference, Retool, Rebuild, Renew. And an important element of not just where we've been, but where we want to go and what we're planning for the future is looking to the next generation of rural housers. Now, the HAC staff spend a good deal of time calling around the country, talking to different organizations, interviewing young people who are in our business, if you will. Uh, we talk to quite a few very interesting, really impressive young people. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring all of them. But we identified three excellent emerging leaders who give us confidence that the future of our rural housing movement is in good hands. My name is Denise Carr with Native Community Finance in Laguna, New Mexico. People don't have homes. Others have families within families staying in homes. Most of the time it's four families within a home. And to be able to have that own personal space for them, I know gives them happiness and being able to see that change in their face over time is satisfying, it makes me feel good, it makes me know that I have done my part. This is a home as an example of how we assist the people with the HUD-184s. Uh, we help them with the application process. We get them pre-approved uh, for the HUD-184 mortgage. Once, get, once they do get pre-approved, we assist them with the TSR reports, the surveys. We write up the leases. And from there, um, because most of the time, banks don't like to deal with homes within our native lands, so uh, we oversee the construction part of it specifically. It's a completely beautiful home. When I had talked to her, she was living something small, something almost unlivable. The way that she talks to somebody and connects with them, and she also walks both worlds, the Indian world and, and the Western world, she is able to understand and communicate what we need. When it comes to mortgages, lending, every, um, the whole aspect of financial in Indian country, it's a new language. None of these terms were ever part of the language or even spoken about on the reservation. And with Denise's learning abilities and able to grasp the, 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 the whole scope of lending and then translating it into it, our, our understanding on, on the reservation, it's, it just makes a world of difference when we're working with our clients. And I'm glad to see that she's come back to the reservation as far as well, being on the Laguna Pueblo Reservation, as far as helping out um, tribal members in loan programs and this new home mortgage program that they currently have. She was very helpful in explaining everything that I needed to do even more satisfactory because I'm helping my people and I know they've been able to do for me and being able to return that is rewarding. I was able to travel out to Zuni, San Felipe, other pueblos within the state and seeing the housing there and some aren't built very well, some it's just passed on from generation to generation. I'm currently an architecture, engineering, and drafting major at this CNM, which is um, Central New Mexico Community College. I want to be able f to allow the people to come to me for anything, whether it's information on a computer and application for a home, or if they want me to personally design their homes, I will. 
and even as far as the constructions, I want to be able to go out there and be able to provide them a stable home and make sure that it is built correctly. And in order to do any of this, I do need to attend school within and attend class within these different fields Those to learn transfer. Well, I'll transfer over. Okay. We're, we're all getting gray haired and uh, that's, that's a challenge because we, we have to have these people with a drive like Denise has. So we have to look into our community and mentor, you know, up and coming young people to fall in, in our steps as, as, and hopefully they do even a better job than what we've done. We've made a very small dent and I think the, the young generation like Denise will make a bigger impact than we ever did. I knew that was something that I wanted to do. Something I know I could make a change for the people, for myself, for anybody. And being a woman, it just makes me strive even more. My name is Julio Lamas. I'm with Visionary Home Builders in Stockton, California. I got into affordable housing through an internship with the California Coalition of Rural Housing. I was placed with a mentor and went through intensive training um, and was with the internship program for a year. And so it really taught me uh, a lot of what it means to develop affordable housing. And after that year, I knew that this was the field that I wanted to be in and have been in the field for about five years now. He started off in the single family department where we were buying up um, NSP, which is Neighborhood Stabilization Program, uh, and he was working on renovating uh, single-family homes and putting low-income families into that program. Uh, recently, we brought him up into the multifamily arena, so Julio's getting a rounded education on the development of affordable housing. There's a, a variety of um, housing needs in San Joaquin County and Stockton specifically for um, large families um, and also farm worker uh, housing as well as um, veteran housing. I'm a project manager with our development department so I am tasked with overseeing the um, financial feasibility of developments from the conceptual phase through the construction and eventually through the permanent uh, financing. We're at Bradford Apartments which is a really interesting property because um, the city of Stockton approached us um, with this property that was boarded up, um, had severe fire damage, and was looking for someone to come in and really um, create something beautiful for the community. So we're looking to house 26 low to moderate income families in this development once it's fully renovated. So one of the most exciting parts of these developments is when we're finished with construction and we start leasing up and bringing families on site to take a look at their units. We have a grand opening, we invite elected officials, we invite community members, we invite the families that have already signed up for the units and just welcome them into their new home and make them feel as comfortable as possible. It looks like we're moving pretty good with construction. What I see in Julio is that desire to take a leadership role that wants to learn and continue to give back to the community. I feel like in the development world of affordable housing, we have the world at our hands on a daily basis because we can see change in the work that we do. Good, affordable housing opens up the door for, many, for much more opportunities for the families. People specifically in my generation are very ambitious to make a difference in, in the world and the field of affordable housing provides an outlet for you to do that. So we're at Casa de Esperanza, it's a 74 unit farm worker housing development that just finished construction this month. It's a beautiful property that, that shows all the hard work we put into it. We have a number of different players for the kids to take advantage of after school because this is a large family development. We have a great property manager on site. Um, she takes a really active role in making sure the, the tenants are feeling at home. Our wait list will prob probably go, go to like a two year wait list, just for uh, this year. For me, it really stems from my, my childhood. Um, I grew up in a low income community. Um, it was a 
a mobile home park that did not have adequate resources, lacked paved roads, didn't have sufficient lighting, um, really just a neighborhood that um, was almost forgotten. Every time um, I'm working on a new development, uh, it reminds me of some of those challenges that families are going through, and I feel proud to be a part of their journey um, to bettering themselves. I'm Shekinah Washington with Allendale County Alive in Allendale, South Carolina. Allendale County is in the top 10 of the one of the poorest communities in the country. At one time, Allendale was booming. It was 301, but then Interstate 95 came into existence. So a lot of the hotels, they weren't receiving business anymore, the restaurants, and a lot of people, they left from this area. In just about every community, there's dilapidated houses. Some of them don't have heating and cooling units, and it gets very, very hot here in the summer. Some of them become ill because of that need. I run into a lot of roof leaks and, you know, the ceiling's caving in, but they just still live in those situations. I am the housing director. I work with the rental rehab projects, with the emergency rehab projects, the owner-occupied rehab projects, also some of the loan projects, the loans to purchase homes, the loans to rehab homes. I also work with mortgage assistance here, and I also do finance. This homeowner is disabled, hey, so he's you? in desperate need of a wheelchair ramp here. It'll um, help him to get in and out of the house to access the door. Um, we're also going to widen one of the doors in the inside leading to the bathroom, and the bathroom is also going to be made handicap accessible, so he'll be able to move freely on his own in the house. When I go into a house, I like it's either my home or a close family member's home, and I just feel like this person needs to live in the same safe environment that I would want my own mother to live in. She's probably going to pull up back here when she brings him into the house. Well, so we may go out eight foot and then turn. Okay. And then go out the other eight foot. So put yeah, up, uh, that way it won't be going too far back. She has uh, shown leadership uh, and, and taking over the, uh, our housing program and really running with it. Does she own this house? Because she's young and she uh, has made an investment in trying to learn uh, as much as she can about housing and she has great people skills and, and, and that above everything else is what's essential. That's probably her biggest asset and that she's not afraid to take um, charge and to, to lead. This is an example of one of our emergency rehab projects. Um, you'll see that we put new siding on the house, also did the windows. She has a washer and a dryer that's inside the storage on the back of the house. And also a brand new hot water heater is in there. We did some cabinets, we did some work in the bathroom. Uh, her roof was leaking very, very bad and the ceiling had began to cave in. Miss Washington, she did all she could did for me. I'm, like I say, if it wasn't for her, I don't believe my house would have got done, you know, like it's supposed to. But with her help and blessing and stuff like that, she helped me prove it. I really appreciate the job that she done. I love it. <laughs> it's like a dream house to me. I really love it. You have more housing now that have been upgraded because of her. Um, she's also looking for programs that she would like to try and initiate for helping uh, citizens here. People give her great respect as far as being a leader because they're asking her questions always and her opinions and for her help. She is a person that cares and wants to see people live better and be happier. It's a good feeling to know that you've helped someone buy their first home or you've helped someone live in a safer environment. For young people who are getting into the field of affordable housing, you have to be passionate about it. You have to be dedicated. It's not gonna be an easy job. If you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. You just gotta have that, that spirit about you that makes you just want to, to help people. And to me, I feel like helping people just comes naturally. We're confident and, and uh, that within, within the year that she will be assuming uh, the executive leadership of the organization. But I know it was important that we try to cultivate, train, prepare someone that could really step in, has, a, has, a, has some sort of history with the organization. And so, um, and she's really developed the community connections because it, once you move from 
her position of housing director to the executive position now it's a you know you're dealing with a, a wide of a, a array of, of partners and, and and relationships so um, she's shown that she has the ability to do that and so we're we're very excited about it and i would advise any organization if you not don't have a plan in place you better hurt and get one we realize that a lot of us were the baby boomers and we better start uh, preparing the new leadership and getting people prepared to take over our roles in the affordable housing arena. We're very eager to make an impact in the field and uh, very eager to learn and so it, it really would be a great opportunity for current leaders to take notice of this generation that's looking to make a difference. You just love to be able to help a family and help them to be in a better living situation. It's great to give back. What say we ask our stars, Denise, Shekinah, and Julio to come up? And we have another star who is going to moderate our panel, Eileen Fitzgerald. Let me introduce Eileen. Eileen is, as I'm sure all of you know, is the president of Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future, a national nonprofit membership organization consisting of 11 of the nation's highest capacity nonprofit affordable housing developers and owners. Eileen has been active in the housing and community development industry for over 20 years, including senior roles at the Fannie Mae Foundation, the Macaulay Institute, the AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust, and as many of you know, was the acting RHS administrator at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. From 2005 to 2014, Eileen served as chief executive officer at NeighborWorks America. Now, uh, I'd like to, before we start, Eileen, a uh, couple of things. Uh, I'd like to introduce, Denise's parents are here, and I'm going to embarrass them because I didn't tell them I was going to do that, but I'd like to ask her mom and dad to stand, the proud parents. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, our young people on the panel uh, have told me they're not used to speaking before large groups. And I told them, you have nothing to worry about. You're surrounded by good people, right? <laughs> so, so yours, Eileen. Thanks. Well, that, I mean, that video was amazing. And, uh, you know, most of these guys have not seen themselves on video before. So I, I know many of you in the audience, when, when you see that, you just focus on, like, oh, gosh, I wish I'd, I'd worn something different. Uh, but I thought they were, they were incredibly polished and just so articulate. So thank you also for going through the video experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do just a, a quick little introduction to build on what we saw in the video. So uh, first we have Denise Carr, who's the Assistant Loan Officer at Native Community Finance. Um, she is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna and also half Hopi. Denise is a certified USDA 502-504 preparer, a VITA tax representative, and a certified financial education and homebuyer education trainer. She conducts homebuyer and financial education classes for different tribes and pueblos in New Mexico. And as we saw in the video, she helps the executive director with all kinds of processing and recording for um, HUD-184 and VA loan applications. Julio Lamas is a project manager for Visionary Home Builders of California. Um, he was first introduced to the field of affordable housing through an intensive one-year internship with one of my favorite programs, the California Coalition for Rural Housing Internship, while completing his undergraduate degree in community and regional development from the University of California at Davis. Julio currently works as a project manager for Visionary Home Builders, which is in Stockton. He also worked as a housing counselor with the same agency and as a loan administration specialist with RCAC's loan fund department. Shakina Washington is the housing director of Allendale County Alive, which um, is located in South Carolina. Allendale is one of the poorest counties in the, in the nation. 
Shakina is responsible for oversight and implementation of the creation and preservation of a broad range of affordable housing opportunities, and she initiates and administers their housing development work. She is also a certified housing counselor and an active community volunteer. So our goal for today is um, for you to really hear from these fantastic folks' perspectives, and I challenge all of you to go away today with two or three ideas about how do you recruit and retain and attract younger people in your community into this work. Um, so that's your assignment as we go through this, and we're just gonna have a conversation. Um, so all of you guys are based in the communities you serve, and you've grown up seeing some really challenging housing conditions. You're clearly passionate about the importance of home, right? Um, how do you reach out to your potential customers and build trust? And do you see that your generation does that differently uh, than those who may have come before you? Any thoughts on that? Where do we start? <laughs> Denise, do you wanna, do you wanna start with that? Uh, I know that home buying process can be so intimidating, right? And, and when you're doing it on tribal lands, it's just, it's, you know, it's tougher for folks to just understand all the pieces that they have to go through. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you go through that relationship when you first meet a potential customer um, that makes them feel more at ease in the situation? Usually with applications, I try to break it down because a lot of the vocabulary within the paperwork is difficult to understand. So I just simplify, <laughs> as you saw in the video. I usually put the application in front of them. I try to read upside down. <laughs> and then I break it down that way. And with the application, like with the HUD 184, it includes surveys and land leases, the TSRs, and um, NICPO reports, so a lot of the lingo that they don't understand where most places they just give them the paperwork and tell them, go get this. Whereas here um, with the company and Native Community Finance, we take that, they just give us the surveys, we write it up, we send it in to the tribal offices, and we um, then forward it then to the um, BIA they don't have to worry about it, we do that for them. And is there anything that, you know, as you went through this process, you learned to do better or differently as you tried different ways of trying to interact with your customer? Usually we keep them on call, we have different phone numbers for them, cell phone, home phone number, email, and we usually ask them on the applications to give us a couple relative phone numbers because in native community, any small community, Everyone knows one another, everybody's your sister's next door. And it's just a different way to get a hold of them. And we keep them updated as far as their status on the home or status of a loan. Um, we usually try to keep that one-on-one -on -one contact with our clients. Well, yeah, you've done different things with customers and uh, from multifamily to housing counseling. So how, how do you think about that? I would say um, one of the challenges um, we have is maybe bringing clients into the doors. That's probably the biggest challenge, right? Getting um, families to come in. Um, and when I was doing housing counseling in our home ownership rental center, we did housing counseling and loan modifications. Um, and so there was a lot of mistrust with what was going on, especially with their relationships with maybe their lenders or their, their loan servicers. And so. Um, it was really important for us to go out into the community and meet people, um, you know, whether it was at some kind of an activity fair, whether we were um, tabling um, for um, like a family day kind of at the park, just so that um, they maybe felt comfortable that there was someone in their community trying to provide a service that they may be able to, to qualify for. Um, and also, it was very important that we partnered with other nonprofits in the community that um, had like, you know, some name recognition and some um, positive connections with um, members of the community as well. And so once we made that connection and they felt like we were not there to take advantage of them um, and we were really there to help them through the process, whether it was purchasing their first home or through a loan modification, then they came into the door and then we were able to just um, take them through the process of qualifying and making sure that they got everything they, need, they needed to get through the programs. 
And did you ever feel like your youth was a, an advantage or a disadvantage with some of your customers? Um, I think um, it can it can be a, a good advantage because we'll I mean we seem maybe hopeful and um, uh, you know we can we kind of get them engaged and and they feel like um, you know there's someone there willing to put some extra time into this. Well, it's probably common for many nonprofits, but we don't work a normal 40-hour work week, right? And so, um, you know, whether it's having to do uh, follow-up with the clients and just make sure that um, we haven't lost connection with them, um, I think, you know, that youthfulness really helps out with that. Shakina, how about you? Um, how do you engage with your customers uh, locally that you're serving, and do you do that any, any way differently maybe than those who've come before you? Well, I think one of the things that makes it easier in our community is the fact that when I first started working for Allendale County Alive, we were a part of starting one of the neighborhood associations there. And so that neighborhood association, they were very involved. They even helped us with the programs. They went and they spoke to the people in their neighborhood. So uh, when it's a lot easier when it's your own people, you know, helping you and telling you about different programs and they are in your neighborhood. So they know you better than you know than we know them ourselves. So that helps a lot. And since then, we've actually helped establish six neighborhood associations in our county. And again, is there anything about being you know more useful that has been an advantage or a disadvantage for you? I think so because of the fact that um, the previous housing director, she was older. So when I came along, you know, they look at you as if you're you're younger, so you don't, you know, they don't think you know everything. They'd rather speak to the other person, but. <laughs> so how, if, if there's somebody in the audience who is like you and is, is following in that, what did you find work to, to help you be successful in that situation? Show them, gotta show them. <laughs> I would agree with that. So, you know, in addition to engaging customers, you all also engage other partners, right? So, you know, besides the, the beneficiary, the customer is living in the house or that you're counseling, um, and maybe sometimes those partners are, are a little tougher when you're younger, you know? They, they might have different kinds of expectations. Um, Julio, you know, you've gone now to the multifamily side, so you're probably dealing even more so with uh, partners and lenders and, and other folks in the process. How, um, how does that, you know, do you, do you have any challenges with, with being young, establishing your credibility for that? Well, I think, um, I'm gonna defer back to um, kind of um, some responsibility I had as a board of directors for a nonprofit that I was, um, I was a treasurer. And we, our goal was to um, pro kind of provide a platform for the community to come together and maybe, you know, identify resources that we maybe needed to um, provide. Um, and this is all a voluntary um, homeowners association. But um, we established a financial literacy uh, day, you know, just because it's, we talked to the community members that would go to the meetings and it was something that they wanted, right? And so we connected with an assembly member that came and talked to the group. Um, we partnered with the local library to um, provide the venue for free, provide funding for us to get donuts from a local pastry shop. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, we got about 15 people to come in on a Saturday morning for two hours and sit through how to establish credit and how to budget and save. Um, and so for me, it was important because once we started getting a little bit of partnerships with, um, you know, whether it was a library or other nonprofit groups, it just started growing, like the momentum really started growing. And I think they were um, excited when um, I, would, I would go and make these presentations or kind of try to get their support because it was something different and they were, um, they were excited to be a part of that. And so when, we, when, when I think about it in terms of affordable housing and the, apart, the multifamily apartments that we have, we have a captivated audience, right? The tenants that are there and sometimes they can be our biggest advocates because they understand the challenges that they were, you know, in the situations they were prior to being in one of these affordable units. Um, and so, you know, leveraging that when we're talking to lenders in the community, um, other nonprofits that we're trying to partner with. Um, and so it really makes a big difference once we start, um, you know, gaining momentum and trying to build those partnerships locally. 
Nice, how about you for when you're not dealing with customers, but other partners, lenders, government agencies, you know, how, how, how have you built your confidence to, to do that and have them take you as a serious partner? In earlier conversation yesterday, as I had spoken with one of the staff members, <clears throat> I had sh struggled to have anybody take me seriously because I was hired into the company at the age of 19. And as Shekinah had said, <coughs> being young, um, they assume that you don't know, that you don't mm -hmm. understand. And with my parents, I was taught to stand my ground, show them, prove them wrong. And I pick up quick on things. I stay quiet, I observe. Being here today, along with new friends, we can do it. We're here. Kina, how about you? Uh, you know, it sounds from the video like you're poised to, to do even greater things uh, soon in your organization. Um, do you have any, uh, any challenges when you're working with government agencies or lenders, industry folks? Um, yeah, that is true. But I would say that you just got to kind of let them see how it's going to benefit them. You know, don't make it all about your organization and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, like one of the programs we do is mortgage assistance. So when you go and you talk to a lender, I mean, you let them know we're able to help your clients, you know, let them see how it can benefit them also, you know. It's great. It takes a lot of people a longer time to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, folks always think like, wow, you know, younger people come in, they're going to be whiz bang with technology, they're going to, you know, change all this, they're going to be more efficient, they're going to scare me because they're going to expect that I know. Um, you know, how has your experience been with any emerging or, or just using technology in your organization? Is it a place where it's felt like, hey, there is some generation gap or it's all been really comfortable? Can I go first with this one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say <clears throat> I'm the youngest staff member, you know, outside of the work study students that we had that intern there. But uh, it'll soon be five years since I've been there and we finally have a web page. Um, and soon we'll have Facebook. I'm going to cross my fingers. So, <laughs> so um, and, I, and I just think by being younger that, that maybe sometime, maybe sometime the older ones in the organization do feel that you're trying to just come in and take over and, you know, show off with the technology and everything. But that's not it. It's the technology makes everything a lot easier. And I mean, even you, we can see here at this hack conference how they um, inserted inside our badges, you know, telling you go ahead, download the app, and they've been able to just communicate with us, let us know. I think it was one part last night when I got a message came to my phone said, "Shh, the presenters are about to start." So, I mean, it's, it's very, very helpful. So, and uh, what kind of you know the perseverance to to get that after five years, you know how. So if, if there's someone else in the audience who's younger and is trying to do that same thing in their organization, don't give up. Don't that? give up. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you, you actually have to just go ahead and do it. I mean, what mm -hmm. harm is Facebook going to do? It's, especially if you're just trying to uh, advertise something or promote a new program that your organization is starting. Uh, my ED always says sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> that is a sign of a true new leader, right? <laughs> Julio, Denise, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Um, just kind of on, on that note, on kind of the importance of social media. Um, our department is relatively young, so when I came in, we already had Facebook, and we were doing Google Hangouts, and um, you know, they recommended we updated our LinkedIn profiles. But um, I think it's interesting how Facebook has changed. And so for me, the way I use it, even with my company, is that it's um, more of a way to get information, right? More than like a social interacting thing. And so that's why it's important for nonprofits that have 
um, programs that they want to advertise, new programs that they're developing to kind of put it out there um, because you never know who's, who's looking at it, even if it's a quick glance. Um, I know if, if I see something that maybe um, I, so another colleague can take advantage of, I'll shoot them the link. Right? I'll, let, I'll, I'll try to engage them. Um, and so it's, I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to have Facebook already on a web page. But I, I do think, you know, I want to stress the importance of having those, um, those social media sites accessible for the staff and for the community to get involved. How about you, Denise? <laughs> well, when I came into the company, we only had a website. And we just recently got a Twitter and a Facebook page as of last year. And I was on, one day I was on lunch break. I had my own personal Facebook account and my boss, my, our ED comes walking by asking what shenanigans I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of ha- explained it to him. And one day he asked me to create a Facebook and he didn't know what a Twitter was. I just created one anyway. <laughs> and I, I'll explain it to him, but I know he doesn't really care as long as it's doing its thing. But, and. I did kind of explain to him that with a lot of the younger generations, um, that is a really good way to get their attention because even at the dinner table nowadays, even kids young as two, take my niece for example, she's one year old and five months and she knows how to turn on her tablet and go switch to the applications and that's, that's the now. And that's what we have to work with. And pretty soon we may be like back to the future, making our small bagels into a large pizza. <laughs> but uh, it is important because technology is moving a lot faster than we can actually learn. And I, for those of you who, who don't ever get on Twitter, I would, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure is several in the audience. Um, I was in a recent meeting of CEOs. I was kind of shocked how many folks were. I never, you know, it's like the, the, this forbidden thing. I really encourage you just to set up an account and follow people. You don't have to participate actively. Mm-hmm. It will make you feel more comfortable. Uh, it's a really great way of getting a lot of media now use Twitter as a, as a way of getting stories. So after you start just following people. And then, you know, you can kind of gradually, it's like stepping at the edge of the ocean and slowly going in. So. Um, the, um, so, um, if there are executive directors or other senior leadership of organizations in the audience trying to hire folks like you, what do you think is the most effective way of recruiting and retaining young, talented staff? Especially so, in rural areas. Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll talk to that. Um, affordable housing is interesting because um, I mentioned it to a couple of people already. It's, it's really a niche field, right? So you don't go to, you're not in high school one day, and you're like, you know what, I want to do affordable housing. Or even, <laughs> even in college, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not something that's really brought up. Um, unless you've had some personal experience with affordable housing, will you even have heard of it or even know that it's out there? So um, I'm grateful that I was able to do that, that internship program because it, it really exposed me to the field. And I think that uh, when we talk about recruiting for rural areas, it can be challenging because the, the towns can be very small. I've heard, I was talking to some people yesterday whether it's towns as small as like 120 people. Like how do, you, how do you recruit people to come into town and get involved in affordable housing? Um, so I think it's important that we look for um, opportunities to partner with universities um, to bring people maybe from uh, different areas or regions to get involved with affordable housing. And I know some of the executive directors, at least in Northern California, originally got involved in affordable housing through the AmeriCorps program, right? They weren't necessarily doing affordable housing, but they were, um, I think they were digging trenches to uh, provide infrastructure in rural communities, right? And one thing led to another, and um, they came to be, you know, leaders in affordable housing. Um, and so I think it's, um, that's one real way to um, do outreach and bring, peop- bring new young faces to the field of affordable housing. Uh, Shanika, what do you think on that? Um, at first, I said I wasn't going to comment on this question because my ED is here. <laughs> but um, uh, I would, I, I actually think it's easier in this uh, area to to 
retain the ones that you already have, the workers that are there, versus to recruit. Um, it's hard to recruit and, and get new faces to get younger people involved, um, like Julio said, because people, they, they really don't know about what it is that we do. Um, there are volunteer groups that also go around in our area, and I think that would be the perfect time to get younger ones involved. Um, and then you can really see if those people are interested in the field, you know? And if you see people going out doing that, that would be the perfect person to try and recruit for your organization. You know, they do cleanup days, things like that, different churches, different uh, organizations and different neighborhood associations. At least once a year in our community, they do that. And you'll see some of the younger ones just come out and help. So I think that's a good way to recruit. Denise, any ideas on this? Along with the community involvement, uh, from where I am from, we have what we call village work. And the community gets together, whether it's cutting the weeds, doing whitewashes in our church, just basically restoring what's been broken down, cleaning up our villages. <laughs> and there's young ones, there's elders, there's middle-aged. And I know there's usually conversations that get to starting as far as going back to our traditional ways, current technology, jokes. And I know, like with my father, he's a project manager, so usually when he comes home, his work is there at the dinner table. We discuss our daily lives, what goes, goes on. I know that's one way that is a recruitment. Another way, I, I do suggest, because this happened within my high school, is that the EDs or an employee actually came into the school and presented what they actually do for a job, whether it was a PowerPoint or on a tablet. They kind of showed us, I remember one was um, a program called Riddit. I don't know if any of you guys have worked with Riddit, CAD, um, computer aided drafting. And with it, from what I understand, it's 3D dimensional. And with the technology nowadays, that grasps their attention. And just physically showing them what you do, what it is about, what they can do to impact the community and further out is a great way to communicate. Because also with the younger ones, they appreciate the fact that you personally go to them to teach them rather than having, say, send your assistant. Like, I understand that it's hard at times to, for you to personally go out considering a lot of the levels that you guys are at, but it is appreciated when you're out there sharing your own experiences, showing how you came to where you are today. So, um you know, kind of a part of retention is um, what, are, what are the opportunities you have for leadership in your organizations? How do you grow professionally in your organizations? Um, do you, any of you have examples of what, what stands out as an opportunity for growth or, or a good example of how you had delegated responsibility that has both maybe helped you want to stay at your organization but also, you know, primed you to be a leader in the future? Julio, do you have an um, idea on that one? I would say that um, that's what keeps it exciting, is that there's opportunities to grow and learn, right? And I remember, I, I think back to when I was a housing counselor, and um, I was asked to take over the financial literacy class, like teaching the class. And it's an eight-hour class Saturday. It's a full-day class, right? And um, it was very intimidating. And I know, you know, I wanted to do it. I was just really nervous. Right, but um, the, my director at the time really encouraged me, um, and and kind of went through the process with me, tried to calm me down, and um, and it was really nerve. I was really nervous um, when I went in front of the, the, my first class. But I knew that he was there in the audience, um, and you know sometimes I might have got caught up in um, the course, but he he jumped in and helped me out. And so by the second or third time, I was easily just taken over the class and. Um, I think it's important that um, you know there's 
um, some responsibility that's put on our shoulders because I think once it's no longer, once you're no longer just assisting someone with a project, it's on your lap, you're like, you're go, right? And you're, <laughs> you really want to make sure that you, you do the best at it. And so um, putting, putting young staff like in the driver's seat, I think is very important. Um, uh, Shakina or Denise, your thoughts on anything? As you said, um, the continuous work keeps us there. Um, I understand that some people are at a desk job. I hear constant complaints. I'm bored. I want to go out and do work. And what keeps me where I'm at right now, my boss, our ED is always telling me that I'm going to be taking a, a care of my adopted grandfather because he wants to retire and he's going to give me the position one of these days. And I know he's joking, but <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but it does give me that confidence because there are times where he'll just come to my desk, throw paperwork <laughs> at me, and tell me to do it. And honestly, there's been times where I have no clue what it is until I read it, <laughs> which is kind of how I got into leases. And he he's slowly training me. I know he is for what. I'm not too sure just yet. <laughs> but I do thank him for having that confidence in me. Um, just that continuous work, seeing the satisfaction in people's faces when they get the keys to their home. It's being able to give back to our community. It's not what the people can do for you is what you can do for them is what keeps them there. Can any advice to executive directors? <laughs> about, about how to help delegate? <laughs> um, I would say um, delegate, delegate responsibilities to a younger person and listen to what they have to say. Uh, take the feedback. Um, you know, let them learn from their mistakes. Of course, you're there to help them and just let them know that, that they can just come ask you and um, if they need any help with it. You know, don't really just throw it at them and like, okay, this, this application needs to be turned in. So Denise, I know what you're talking about. This application needs to be turned in by a certain date. You know, and when they give you the responsibility, don't be afraid to, you know, to go and ask. And they delegate the responsibility to you. Let them know, okay, well, I need this portion of it, you know, from you or whatever, things like that. But listen to one another. You, as a younger person, you want the ED to listen to you, and ED be willing to listen to the younger person. Um. Do you, um, any of you have mentors kind of outside your organization who've, who've helped along and, you know, is any, any advice for folks in the room who might, who might also be wanting to mentor people who are not just in their organizations in this field? Um, I would say yes. Um, and I'm actually surprised one of them is here, Gisela Salgado. Um, and so a mentor really is someone that um, you can call. I remember literally calling her like at 7 p.m. one time, like, hey, what's this affordable housing thing? How's my career gonna happen? And I was already in the field for like two years, but just sometimes you have questions and you want to make sure your, your goals are in line with um, you know, what you're trying to do at, at the, the agency. And so it's important just to have someone to talk to that has been through kind of um, the process and understands the field and can help maybe mostly just calm you down <laughs> more than anything, but um, it's really important to have that connection with someone, um, whether it's in the field or not. So, um, you know, we, uh, Moises talked about a movement. Just if, as you're around here, you'll, you know, lots of people will be talking about how do, we get, how do we get the broader public to care? How do we get elected officials to care about rural housing issues? Um, you obviously, all three of you have, you know, significant day jobs that you got to execute on programs or just make stuff happen on the ground. How do you think about that 
piece of you know building that broader awareness and advocating um, not just for your particular program but for the issue and making people care um, can you get time for that would you do that differently than, than the rest of us have done it for years with the elected officials I would say talk to them right before election <laughs> um, <laughs> Each year we have uh, what we call a fall forum, <coughs> excuse me, or some people may just refer to it as an annual report. Invite them to the different events that you're having. When you have ribbon cuttings, invite them there because, I mean, of course, they'll want to get in the picture and things like that. But, you know, let them know what's going on so they'll be involved and so they'll be aware. And when you let them know what's going on, uh, say things to them in public you know, in front of a, a group of people. So, I mean, then that way you got witnesses that, <laughs> that also heard them, you know. And, and I mean, keep, keep in touch with them, not just because of the fact that you want something from them, you do want their support, but like I said earlier, let them know how the different things that we do in our organization will benefit them also. Denise or Julio, any, any thoughts on this issue? Um, I would say that and thinking back to how executive directors or senior staff can kind of encourage younger um, professionals in this arena it would be to invite them to some of the meetings that they have with stakeholders in the community, if they're me meeting with elected officials, um, and when they're creating those partnerships because it allows us to see the relationship, right? And I think when we're talking about having younger professionals kind of go through the ranks um, with a nonprofit, um, you need to know how to build those relationships. and. Um, I remember being in, invited to meetings, like town hall meetings, when I was an intern, and um, it really got me excited too, being out in the community, and um, I felt that it was very important to be involved with the um, local government process as well, because it affects affordable housing, and so I'm thinking of like the planning commission in general. Um, I even recently applied to be a planning commissioner in my city. I didn't get the position, but um, I'm still following the general plan update process. Um, because they talk about housing, right? And if there's people on that commission that are going to make decisions, um, they can heavily impact um, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and even when we're talking about um, new funding sources that we want to bring into our communities, rural communities can oftentimes be left out. And I know in California, a big talk is this cap and trade funds that are coming out, and they're trying to figure out how to um, have the, how to set the guidelines right for the applications and. Um, as it stands right now, rural communities don't, aren't going to be very competitive. And so we got to make sure that we're at the table um, talking about the importance of affordable housing and how to get some of those dollars into the communities we're trying to serve. Can you say ideas on that? Just to kind of touch base on what, how, what they've explained. Get them to come in, get them to connect, because each community has different rules, different regulations. And just within our community, I do apologize. I understand we're trying to get a grasp of everything, but I'm just using it as an example. I remember one of our leaders, one of the older leaders, they do not like to connect outside of the community. And it's not because they're stubborn, it's more the fear because they don't understand what's coming in, what is being brought in and being able to bring those outside sources come to our council meetings, village meetings, explain what it is these programs are, or how it will benefit the people, how it will benefit the community in the long run. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the correct words, but it's just overall more of trying to get onto that personal level. That way, the community is comfortable. It's, it is, it's all politics. It's always a hearsay. Everyone's always pointing fears. It's overall trying to get that understanding of what the greater good is. So two more questions. The, this one is just this, if there's young folks in the audience or, you know, what are there particular educational experiences or backgrounds um, that you would recommend um, for folks who, who might be interested in, in furthering their career? 
Um, so I was a peer advisor for my academic department when I was an undergrad. And um, I met with a lot of students that had various interests. Um, and so I graduated community development. But what I, what I like about affordable housing is that you can really come at it from many different um, like academic fields, right? Whether it's engineering, mm -hmm. whether it's political science, whether it's real estate development, construction management, business administration, um, law. I mean, you really can they have a lot of opportunities to study what you want to study and then focus on affordable housing. And so um, I think education is a huge um, part of um, affordable housing, especially because that's, it's, it's actually what got me drawn to the field because it's, it's both technical and what we need to understand when we're talking about administering finance um, programs um, with a loan fund um, to you know, maybe talk about general plans, but it's also uh, mission-based. Right, and so um, I think that's a real opportunity to bring people into the field because um, not everyone can do what we do, and so um, I think it's important, definitely education. Denise, you were so eloquent on the video about uh, you know how you were combining your degree you're working on and and why that was important. Uh, anything else you want to add to that? He pretty much took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Rural housing is a really broad subject. I am, as I had stated in the video, I am studying architecture, engineering, drafting, and technology. So I will, if I want to write up the regulations, I will. So can they, if they want to design, they can. If they just want to be on the computer sending out the information, um, social media for these types of things, they can. It's, a rural housing has the potential to go anywhere in any field, and it's just to get them to understand that, that idea of it. And Shakina? No, right now I'm currently enrolled in online classes for organizational management, but the good thing about uh, conferences and workshops like these is, I mean, you never stop learning. There's always mm -hmm. some form or workshop or conference that's going to be available, so you know you can network and meet new people and hear their stories, and um, they can also help teach you and and just help you be more relaxed in your field. So my last question, just is is what do you love about your job? What inspires you to get up in the morning and, and go to work? Whoever wants to, to go first on that one. Knowing the people that knowing that the people are happy. It's when you give them the key. There's some people, families that have never had a home, veterans that come home because they were deployed at the age 15, 16. Seeing tears of joy, tears of happiness because they have something they can call their own. It doesn't have to be a mansion. I've seen some people build Simple, very simple homes, as long as it has a room, as long as it has a kitchen, as long as it has a bedroom, they're fine. Just knowing that they're satisfied, knowing that they're just overall happy is what keeps me in this field. For me, um, what keeps me in the field is what really what brought me into it. Um, I came from a um, low-income community, like I had mentioned in the video. It was a mobile home park um, that really, um, it was interesting because it was they had these like ten foot walls surrounding the, the mobile home park, so it was kind of like a gated community, but kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> or like the opposite, right? Um, and so, um, but it, it was it was interesting because we were a family of seven living in a two room uh, trailer, and we lived there for about eighteen years. And so I, I remember um, there was an instance when I was probably about seven years old, where um, I just couldn't find my own space. I was kind of going from the every room to the kitchen to the, the laundry area. And I didn't really have any place for, for me to just sit down and think and process. Um, so I, I ended up going to the back. Um, we had like a little staircase um, and I'm sitting outside and just looking around and there's all I could see is literally like trailers like around me. It's like these huge walls that were just kind of, um, or I guess barriers is what I was seeing, right? But then I, I look over and I see like these mountains kind of be, just beyond the, the trailers and I, I had this moment of like, 
there's something out there for me, right? There's something out there. Um, I don't know what it is just yet, but I'm going to reach for it, right? And I think for me, being in the field of affordable housing, um, I, I strive to provide that same um, opportunity for a young child to look out their window and be like, there's something out there for me, and to think about their future and want to make a difference, whatever it, it is they want to do. Every day, um, each of us and each of you are making a difference in someone's lives. I mean, that's enough to make you just want to get up and, and, and help someone else again. But one story that always sticks out um, in the video that you all saw earlier, uh, Mr. Loris Wright, the house, what you see is what everybody else sees when they ride down the street. They see a house with side and a house with new windows, a house with a new roof. You know, the house looks totally different from the other houses in the community. But what I know is the real story behind it. And the fact that when Ms. Wright came to us, um, her mother had stage four cancer and her mother was in the hospital. And all she wanted was for her mother to be able to spend her last few months living with her. But she wasn't able to because of the fact that um, when hospice came in or, or, or um, whoever else it was, the group that came in, they said that the house was not adequate. Her mother could not stay there. You know, Ms. Wright, she even said, well, um, my mom, can, she can sleep in my room and I'll sleep in the other room, which had a leaking roof. Um, one quarter of the ceiling was missing. It was caving in. So, you know, they told her her mother could not stay there, you know, unless she could get some work done to the house. And I'm not going to say luckily, but prayerfully, um, two weeks before they came back, the house was redone. And her mother was able to come there and live there. There was a wheelchair ramp. The room uh, was remodeled. Everything was fine. There wasn't any mold, mildew, anything in the house. And her mother was able to come there and live with her the last few months of her, of her life. And that's, that's why you see that look on, on Miss Wright's face. It's, it's not the outward appearance. It's the fact that she was able to make her dream and her mother's dream come true. Uh, so I don't know about you, I feel uh, <clears throat> our future is way bright here. Uh, I want to bottle them all up and, and grab them. Um, I want to thank Hack for doing this. I think this is great. Uh, I, I you know, urge you to to take the time to develop folks in your community. To, you have lots of suggestions about how to reach out, but it does take time. It does, doesn't happen. Someone's not going to show up on your doorstep. Um, uh, but uh, if um, these three are any example of the phenomenal talent that's out there, I think you know we, we can let everyone retire and just let them take over. So let's give them a huge round of applause. Thank Eileen. Eileen did a beautiful job. Thank you, Eileen.